I'd have to be outside for me to look small. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z and I'm joined today by someone special, someone new that hasn't been on the program before. We're at UTV Takeover 2021 in uh, Wainoka, Oklahoma from the uh, Off-Road Syndicate's Rugged Experience trailer. So uh, today I wanted to, to invite uh, Matt up to the podcast. He is from Busted Knuckle. Um, if you don't know who he is, Busted Knuckle Films. There's a lot of Busted Knuckles out there these days, but uh, Busted Knuckle Films. Um, and if you uh, haven't seen him, he does a lot of the rock bouncing coverage uh, for the different race series and things like that, uh, SRRS and all that stuff, right? So, uh, Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, what, how do you say your last name? Myrick? Myrick. Matt Myrick. So, yep. tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, and, and what, you're, what you're up to today. Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, from Coleman, Alabama. We, uh, I, I got started years ago filming off-road stuff, filming me and my buddies out wheeling and kind of turned that into filming rock bouncers and man started making DVDs and stuff when, when back when that was a thing for the young folks at home. Those are the little shiny things I used to put movies on. And uh, <laughs> I now, call those uh, shooting targets. <laughs> right. And then, then we transitioned to YouTube. You know, we started putting the teasers on YouTube to try to get, you know, more traction with that. And uh, they started doing better than, than actually selling DVDs. So we kind of made the transition and put everything on YouTube and the rest is kind of history. Now we got a, you know, full clothing line. We're, we're here at YouTube takeover with our uh, merch trailer set up, selling merchandise and covering some dune uh, stuff. We've, we've been to Glamis. We've been to uh, Silver Lake sand dunes in Michigan. So we've been a couple different places that had dunes, but never been, uh, never been here in Oklahoma. So uh, figured we'd, we'd make the trek out here. It's about 12 hours from where we're from. And yeah, it was like a last minute out. long haul, right? Yeah. <laughs> last minute. I was like, Hey, you guys got any room? And they're like, ah, we might be able to squeeze you in. So it, uh, it all turned out good and we're here to have a good time. And yeah. The, the week started yesterday, uh, at the event and, uh, we had a decent turnout for a Wednesday. Um, midweek is a long haul for middle nowhere uh right. but uh, today's in the pickup definitely there's a lot of social posting about people traveling last night and um iron manning it to the to the show so i expect that today's in the pickup quite a bit yeah the last couple hours are pretty brutal of just like it just looks like you can watch your dog run off for like two weeks or something because right. it's just like long farm roads for <laughs> miles and miles and miles yeah it was uh it was interesting driving in um and and seeing you know it's just all rollers and whatnot and then you get into some trees or something and you get excited again you're like yes right. vegetation and then and then back to windmills yeah and then there's just dunes out here in the middle of nowhere and you pass them like you don't even know they're there right <laughs> i'm looking at it on the on the google maps and whatever i was like why are there dunes just out here in the middle of nowhere just random <laughs> a bunch of farmer fields so uh the, the sand dunes out here are pretty cool they're like a coral color and right. they're, uh, the sand's kind of, uh, it feels almost wet, like it compacts really well. And uh, so you don't even need paddles to, to go out here and run around. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, I feel like I, caught, I brought a, a knife to a gunfight. I brought my uh, razor on portals and 35s. And so, uh, <laughs> so we took it out last night for a little bit, little run. And uh, it definitely doesn't like the dunes, but uh, but it did good. And we had fun. So You got some uh, some big stickies on there, right? Some, yeah, the, some uh, Rockzilla stickies. Yeah, yeah. yeah those, are, those are massive tires. And uh, they always... They always do well. So out in the in the sand, actually, they probably do pretty well. They have a, quite a bit of a of a, a blade cut to them. Right. So yeah, I didn't have any problem with traction. It's more of like there's so much weight from portals in each corner that mm -hmm. the suspension just didn't like it. So the, the well, stock shocks you around a bit. Yeah, the stock shocks trying to control it, especially like the real rough sections where everybody's like you know getting to the gate and everything. All the whoops and everything. Yeah. Pretty rough, so uh, what uh, what what just kind of explain your build a little bit. I know a lot of people that follow your channel know your car really well because they yeah. get beat up on the channel quite a bit <laughs> right. um kind of give a rundown of what you got going sure yeah we basically started with a concept of we wanted to build a razor that could keep up with fully built jeeps on you know 40s 43s stuff like that and uh so we started with a 2017 turbo razor um of course caged it right off the bat it's a four-seater um went ahead and did four inch super atv portals on it 30 percent uh 35 inch stickies on it it's got saturn power steering uh, shock therapy rack, um, RCV axles, RCV prop shaft, um, full ORB suspension on it uh, to make sure you know we don't bend or break anything. And as far as I know, it is the only razor to ever do backdoor and sledgehammer at King of the Hammers. Really? Yeah. We'll have to look into that. Yeah. 
Some guy, some guy commented yesterday that it wasn't the only one, but he didn't have video proof. So, yeah, exactly. So we're still, we'll still <laughs> waiting on it didn't that. Happen, Anybody right? can talk about that. Right. Video <laughs> or it didn't happen. Mine is on video. So, and it was, it was tough, but yeah. we've, we've done a bunch of trips where, you know, we, we did a thing called uh, Trail to SEMA where a bunch of guys got together and we went out and, and trail road for the week before SEMA show in Vegas. And it was all built Jeeps on, on like 40s, 43s, and then me and my Razor on 35s. <laughs> the one guy. The, the one that, guy. You were that guy on the trip. <laughs> exactly. And so it was fun because I got into a lot of places that I wasn't supposed to be um, it, with the Razor, which made it a lot of fun. And uh, it was just fun to, to prove that, you know, a Razor can keep up with, right. with those kind of builds. And, and we had a lot of fun with it. And, and how long ago was that again? Uh, I think that was like two years ago. So we didn't yeah, have it last year. A little while ago. And that yeah. was right when I was starting to get into the thick of, of razors and off-road and, and all that stuff. I was in, <clears throat> A lot of my listeners will know that I've been in IT for like 20 years and then and moved on into my passion work. And um, yeah, so that was right around where I was starting to get real, real thick into the razors. And, and I remember finding you online um, because of that razor. And then subsequently the rock bouncing stuff, right. which was, you know, every little kid's dream to have that monster truck type experience. Right. So how'd you get into uh, the rock bouncers? Uh, we actually just where I'm from in Alabama, like Gray Rock, ORV, Cable Hill. If you ever know anything about rock bouncers, those are like that's like the mecca. That's like the place. Um, you know, if you want to test a rock bouncer, if it can make it up Cable Hill, it's a pretty pretty good build. And uh, that was pretty local to me, so I, I'd go to those events and and I would see them firsthand. And then for some reason, I started videoing those guys, and and those videos did really well because they're just they're just nuts. You know, right. big horsepower rigs. You know, there's, hitting there's things a little bit of that. Open. Can't believe it. Actually, it's that actually where it happens normal right. like a normal life for somebody is that yeah <laughs> and then you know years down the road they got into racing and stuff because you know back in the day you had to know somebody to figure out where these guys were going to be you know right. you know, know where the big events were and stuff like that and now it's racing all the time so there's a schedule and you know where everybody's going to be so it's a little easier now but back in the day it was tough you had to you had to know somebody and, and be on the on the inside of everything to figure out you know where to go to see the see the rock bouncers and see the action so how how far back can you remember seeing bouncers out there <laughs> um, I mean, 2011 is when I started doing this full time. I mean, probably 2005 or six. I mean, I, I used to go ride. I had a sport quad 400X, and I used to go ride a place called Wheel in the Country, and I would see those guys out there, you know, riding there. At that point, I didn't really know what they were or what they were called, but uh, but we would see them out trail riding. Just stuff. monsters out yeah. in the woods. <laughs> a lot of guys, the, the guys that kind of originated it, they I think they all started out drag racing and street racing. Right. And got tired of getting in trouble with the cops and getting stuff impounded and things like that. And and somebody actually took one of their drag car motors out, put it in a jeep, oh. and built it on one tons of stuff, and and started beating it. And they were like, man, this is a lot of fun. You know, we can go to these private off road parks and and have a good time, and nobody bothers us. We don't have to worry about right. getting anything impounded. And that's kind of I think that's kind of where the whole rock bouncing stuff kind of started. And you look back at the days of, of the, you know, even just those 10 years ago, like what they were compared to what they are now. Oh, like yeah. I was just, I was just doing a, a refresher while I was getting ready this morning, put my shoes on, just kind of poking through some videos and whatnot. And, and it's amazing some of the builds that are coming out these days, like just how insane they are. And one of my favorite ones is one guy's got it like super slammed and then he's off to the side on one side. Like it's a, it's a fully like rusted out looking build. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember what his name is. Outlaw. Yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah, yeah. and uh, put an LS motor beside him next to him. And it right, was, it yeah. was the first rock bouncer that was independent suspension front and rear, and it did really good. I don't know why they they eventually cut the rear suspension and made it solid axle on the rear, but I mean when it was fully IFS, the thing did really well. They had a, a local race to us, and he showed up for the first one and just dominated. It was it was crazy. It was like his first race out. Right. So I mean, you, you, back in the day, it was basically just whatever truck parts were laying around got welded together and, right. and put strapped a motor to it and nowadays they got a full there's a, a full chassis companies out there now where you can literally just go buy a rock chip bouncer chassis right and, and that's actually something that, that we do i uh, i partnered up with uh jake berkey and and mm -hmm. we build chassis and full-blown yep. turnkey rigs now and and try to you know a lot of a lot of the rock bouncer stuff they they get a bad bad rap bad reputation because you know uh, they're known for overheating or not having good suspension and stuff like that and so we've kind of like taken the taken the razor way of you know building these production styles so we can build them for a better price they're getting a better product and something somebody could just jump in that's simple enough that they can go have a good time and right you know have that good off-road experience and that's what's kind of all about for us and, that vehicle. and it's not like it's um it's cheapened in any way it's actually just like you guys have seen what works over the years right and you said well let's just put us all in one package and make it all at one point in time and then you can just buy it 
Right. Um, and so many people get into the get into the sport of rock bouncing. And they'll, they'll they'll buy a rig for forty grand, and then by the time they're done with it, they'll spend eighty trying to figure out how to make it right and make exactly. it make it work the way it's supposed to. And so our turnkey rigs start out at start out at eighty grand, but you don't have to do anything to it. They're basically turnkey, ready to go. You hop in, want to go. So uh, what kind of engineering effort was put into you know getting those? those templates set up and the the frame holders and and right all that stuff. that's where jake comes in i mean he's a he's an engineer by trade and, and he he figured out you know we have full jig table set up uh, a tube dragon that does all the notching and we have a, a cnc bender as well everything is cad modeled um, everything's tested out flexed out you know on the computer to make sure everything's going to work and I, I it was crazy to me seeing that whole process come together and and go from something on a computer and image to like a right. full build ready to go and like the the very minimal things that you had to do, you know, to make everything work from that computer model to, to real life. It's, it's kind of crazy the way all that stuff works now with engineering and everything. And, and the way they work is just ridiculous. I mean, most of them ride better than a razor. Yeah, no, there they're definitely there's a ton of geometry that went into those and, and it's pretty impressive. Um, so do you guys have multiple chassis models or do you stick with one platform and, and go with that? Uh, we uh, just released our second model. So our first model is called the, the Ride Series and it's more of a, you know, aggressive rock bouncer. It's got 16 inch front shocks and then 16s in the rear. So 25 inches of uh, rear travel because of the trailing arms and 16 in the front. Uh, and then we just came out with one called the Vision Series because we had a lot of people, we have high front shock towers. So we always had people mentioning, you know, they'd like to see something a little lower. Uh, so we put 14 inch shocks on the front and lowered everything down uh, I think it's like five and a half inches on the front end um, and that one's more full panels on it. it's more like ultra four style kind of a mix between a rock bouncer and ultra yeah. four so uh, so we have two chassis to choose from for right now and uh, we're working on trying to figure out how to do a four seater and make it look I was, good, I was just going to ask you do we have the family version yet? right it's a uh, it's <laughs> it's very difficult to make a four seater rock bouncer and make it look good and function well and, and have the travel and stuff that we we want out of them so so that's that's something that's still in the works maybe we'll have something for 2022 for for something like that but we're we gotta get one of your builds on out to one of our events and see how yeah. it does out. In the I, I wanted to bring one this time. It just it just didn't work out. Um, I'm actually building one for myself. Uh, me and Jake both had rock bouncers before we started the the off road shop, and uh, we both sold them so we could get it started. Get and, things and off the so, ground. Uh, we built one for an RD rig, and I've been driving it a bunch. I mean, I've driven it at Disney. Uh, I was gonna say, it, I think I just saw you this summer on on some videos up there. Right. So I've driven it a pretty good bit. Um, and I wasn't the first one that rolled it. He rolled it. So that was good. <laughs> you just got called out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but mine's in the works. It's a chassis right now. Um, hopefully, it'll be going to powder in the next couple of weeks. And uh, we'll get it finished up. And, and I'll plan on taking it. I'm going to take it a lot of places it doesn't belong. Because I feel like that's where you get the most you know attention. Like yeah. bringing a rock bouncer out here, people would probably oh, they'd flip. think it was crazy. So especially if I could find some like 35-inch paddle tires to put yeah. on it. Because they, they have uh, high and low range. you know, So you can put them we got to get you down range. on the drag strip racing the like yeah. the unlimited class. Yeah. yeah that'd <laughs> Throw, be a good time. We'll just throw a, a razor plastic on the front and call it a UTV. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to put a razor grill on it. <laughs> oh, man. So um, as far as, like, you were talking suspension travel and everything, something I've noticed is there's kind of, like, two approaches to the bouncers. Like, there's the guys that are up high and have lots of, like, clearance, like, straight off the gate. And then there's the guys that are sitting lower, but they extend further. Um, is there a different approach to suspension for um, kind of just different races or different buggies or like how does that come into play? Because you're just slamming these things into walls basically right. <laughs> at full RPM and, and seeing how it handles. Yeah, and that's it's it's difficult to, uh, to to find that right balance between you know ride height and suspension travel and everything. And, and when we try to we try to set it up to where you have the best of both worlds. But I mean it, it's all different for different courses too. I mean some courses you'll have massive ledges to where something that's low to the ground is not going to do well and you're going to have to jump it, but I mean, the guys that are the suspension and stuff, we're running triple bypass shocks and cool carriers and stuff on these, these rigs now that, I mean, if, they're, if the ledge is below your knee, you just don't even lift. You, yeah. just, you just hit it wide open, and, and most of them will just bounce right up it and, and soak it all up. So it's pretty pretty crazy what they can do What now. are the uh, average tire sizes? Because, I mean, they've got some massive tires out on these things, too, down nope. uh, down in the races. Yeah, most are running, like, 42s or 43s. Yeah. So it seems to be the common size. Yeah, they're they're pretty big, and so you can roll over most things, and especially I'm assuming your your pressures aren't very high, right? Um, but I would imagine depending on the course, you would change that. And some of them you're on your on your rock or your uh, your dirt dirty ones where you're you're trying to get as much traction. You're probably a little bit. Uh, softer, and then on the on the rocks where you're throwing things in hard, you're probably a little stiffer. Right, and that's a common misconception we get. You know, 
comments on YouTube all day long about it, about airing down more and things like that. And, and, and when you're racing and, and even just like rock bounds and trail riding in general, you know, if you don't have enough pressure in the tires and you hit a ledge hard enough, you're going to break or bend a wheel. Right. Um, so most of the guys are running, you know, 10 PSI at, at minimum. And then, you know, some of the racers are running 20. I was gonna say some, a, some guys are at twenties or higher. Yeah, if they gotta hit a, a ledge super hard. They're gonna make sure they. Have and they're not like on soft tires either. Right. <laughs> like these are super well, I mean, thick tires. They are very thick tires, but I mean they're sticky compounds, so they yeah you know they, they have, have some flex stuff. Right. But uh, that's a lot of rotating mass, and you can imagine um, you know from the UTV world, a lot of our listeners you know they're they're used to you know 150 horsepower, you know maybe 200 horsepower, something like that. Uh, you know, you guys are throwing down quite a bit more than that. Kind of, kind of go over what your engine platform is. Right. So uh, for our production rigs, uh, we have a couple different engine packages. Um, basically, the the base model is a LS3, makes about 550 horsepower. Uh, we have a 408, a 427. Uh, 427 is like 650, I think. And then all of those can have a blower on top added. I was going to well. say a lot of these cars are, are cars. These a lot of these bouncers right. are, are supercharged or, or whatnot. And so um, we're not we're not talking little uh, efficient motors here. These are big guzzlers that really push a lot of air. So right. Um, you yep. know what's the kind of approach there? I, I know some of the cars. Uh, you look at the motors and they're just massive. Um, and some of them are smaller and more lightweight and a little bit more compact. Um, you know, kind of explain maybe what you're what you would see there as far as approaching that. Right. Yeah. I guess one of our most famous builds is called Gold Rush, and it had a uh, 565 cubic inch uh, big block Chevy on alcohol with a big Pro Charger on it, and it made 1600 horsepower, and, and everybody right. thought it was ridiculous, and it was well, ridiculous. Well, it is. It is <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> but I mean, that guy came from the drag racing world, and he was like, "I want this motor in, in my buggy, and I want to have the the buggy with the most horsepower ever." And so that's that's the approach we went with, and uh, it did it did well. But, uh, you know, we, we quickly found out that when you add that much power, you have to add that much more weight. I mean, it had Dana 80s. It had, we, we were basically R&Ding and figuring out new ways of building drive shafts that would hold up. I, I mean, say all everything kinds of at that point becomes lesser than right on the torque side exactly so. and so i think he figured out quickly that it was a little too much power and so i think everyone's starting to figure that out as well and so now we're kind of moving more towards lightweight and with you know 800 to 1000 horsepower and that seems to be kind of the you know kind of the happy medium because you know the less weight you had to pull up a hill the better right and so the, the better the better you keep the do. momentum exactly especially when you're losing momentum quickly in right. a short amount of time right so what kind of what kind of transmission setup are you running for for these buggies? Uh, most of them are running uh, turbo 400s. Uh, there's a few guys that are running power glides, things like that, but uh, turbo 400s for the most part, and that's what goes in our production rigs as well. Gotcha, and, and those seem to be fairly reliable in that kind of abusive environment. Oh yeah, yeah. Because you normally see sure. those like you know on a drag strip or something where they're they're not really abusing moving parts as per se. Right. Um, whereas you guys are are definitely pushing the boundaries of. Um, physics <laughs> right on these and, they're, machines. and they're fully built you know transmissions because with a rock bouncer that's the light last thing you want to have to pull out you know right. as a transmission so we we get them built fairly well and, and and usually don't have to worry about them so uh what kind of uh places can we see your buggies are they just kind of the guys in the backwoods or are they at the race series and which race series um so we've got a couple guys that are that are racing um when we were building full custom race buggies uh there's some guys out in Oregon that are racing. Um, they're running uh, there's a series called Havoc. Um, mm -hmm. They're running yep. one that we just finished up. It's actually, it was kind of a mix. We did a production model for him and then did a couple racing things to it so that he could, you know, kind of finish it out how he wanted to yep. and go race it. Um, his name's Justin Haft. And then we got some guys that run SRS and some of our old race platforms as well. And then other than that, man, we got a bunch of guys that go out and trail ride and have a good time. And, and it's, it's crazy. I mean, we, we used to build these you know, two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollar full race builds, and you know people would come in and they're just like, you know, not that excited about it. But the guys that come in that want a trail rig and pay eighty grand for one are just like ecstatic. Like the yeah. the. So I mean, the way they react is just just completely different. So in your neck of the woods, you know, trail riding is a lot different than my neck of the woods up in the North Pacific Northwest, right? We got a lot of uh, tr logging roads and trail rides as far as like in the in through the pine trees and all that. Uh, we can get some serious elevation change, you know, ten thousand feet if you want to go on an extended trip. Um, you know, what kind of riding are these guys doing these buggies in? Because I can't imagine they're getting ecstatic fuel mileage on these things and and able to really extend the range on on how far out they go. Right. Uh, we actually just finished one for a guy that lives in Oregon, and he wants to go play on the dunes. And it's got a 22-gallon fuel cell, supercharged 427. Uh, that was our vision one that we just finished up for him, and he's he's going to go and be Running on, on pump? Have a good time. What's that? Running on pump, on pump gas? gas? Yeah. 
yeah, running on 93. So we'll we'll see how that works out for him. But I mean, the customer came to us, and that's what he wanted. And that's what we built for him. So full windshield, full uh, you know roof, full hood, everything, full body panels on the side. So that that one turned out really well. Uh, and then we got other guys that you know around our neck of woods that just go out and trail ride all day in the rocks. And you know where we're from, mostly you know you might be. 20 minutes from the parking lot anywhere in the entire off-road park you know most parks are 500 mm -hmm. to a thousand acres that kind of stuff and then of course now this last year we took three of our production rigs took them out to king of the hammers and wheeled them for five days straight didn't have any failures but i mean we rode everywhere we rode i think we we had two 55 gallon drums of fuel with us and we used every bit of it plus some <laughs> and so so we just we'd ride all day we'd come back to camp that night and fill them up the next morning and go ride some more so they're, so, they're fairly fuel, fuel efficient for what they are you know, they, for for what they are, right. with that nice little asterisk. I mean, and they have a uh, we have 16 gallon fuel cells in the the production uh, riot chassis, so it's a pretty good bit. We could always use a little bit more, but <laughs> that's what that's why we have you know new models coming out every year. So we, we right. want to tweak them every year and and make upgrades, and you know, and that's what that's why we have the R and D rig too. Is you know we go out and beat on and abuse them and figure out you know where we need to improve upon. So it's 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 a constant thing. You know, we're never satisfied. We want to make right. them the best they can possibly be. So are you are you normally building pump gas cars, or are they usually alcohol? Uh, they're usually pump gas. So uh, we kind of got out of building the race rigs and stuff, so uh, most of them are all pump gas. I can't imagine there's more racers. There's probably a lot more of the... Yeah, the trail rig market is is, is a lot larger, and we'll still build race rigs, but they're going to be based off our production platform, So right. which which is, works out great for the racers because they're going to get a bargain. I mean, they're going right. to get a race rig ready to go that's going to be way cheaper than what we would custom build one before. And, and not even just built but like race proven right. r&d proven experience proven and safe exactly and our build time i mean we we were building one or two buggies a year and i think right now we're on seven for this year that we finished and we should have two or three more by the end of the year so so you're you're averaging about a 30 day 45 day turnaround on these yeah so i think i think uh 60 to 90 days is our goal so when we start them out, and, and at this point, we're just we're waiting on suppliers, the supply, as supply is, chain as issues, is the just rest like of the industry, everyone right? else in the entire country. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but we're we're working those things out, and we just got uh we just got some CNC equipment, so we're uh, starting to make some of our own parts and stuff as well um, that helps expedite the build process. And so we're just going to keep keep moving forward and, and doing that stuff the best we can, and, and make things faster and hopefully more efficient. Something that I've been really excited about is kind of the transition of the, the rock bouncing racing scene into the UTVs, or I should say the UTVs into the rock bouncing scene. You're starting to see these guys come. What, what's the, the class for those? There's, I think there's two different classes for those. Right. They have, a, they have a stock class, and then they basically have an unlimited class, which is like tube, chassis, razors. And they've come a long way. It's, it's kind of crazy that uh, you know I, I record them. They race on the same days as the big bouncers and run the same courses. And uh, so they, they call that their bounty series and uh, it's unlimited tube chassis. They've got $3,000 billet transmissions. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like the, you know, the limiting factor before was transmissions and diffs and they've got that worked out to where none of that stuff, you know, breaks anymore. So the, the abuse that those little machines will, will take now is, is pretty incredible. And a lot of times their times are faster than the big bounce. I was going to say they're, they're so lightweight and right. their power to ratio is, is quite a bit more. Right. So um, I've seen, you know, some of the razors go up there pretty fast and I've seen some of the new Can-Am builds go up there extremely fast. Right. Um, and as long as they've got their suspension figured out, it seems like it's not a problem and they can, they can actually do some serious competitive racing on the hills. Yeah. It's been impressive to see, see how far the, the UTV platform has come, you know, for that kind of racing. That's for sure. So, um, as far as the, uh, what you do at these events, you're, you're pretty much just with a camera in your hand the whole time. Kind right. of uh, explain how you got into, you said you started recording early on, but how did that become, you know, something that you do day to day and, and, and your support mechanism? Right. Yeah. We basically just started out, you know, with the guys trail riding and then they got to the point where somebody decided to make a race series out of it. And so we just started kind of following along. We've been at, you know, with SRS since the very beginning, you know, so kind of the OG camera guy. Right. <laughs> so I was the, the crazy kid on the side of the hill getting rocks slung at him, you know, holding the camera. But I, I love it, man. I mean, there's there's not a better seat in the house than than being right there with the right camera, in the middle. you know, right in the middle of it. Yeah. Dodging <laughs> rocks. And uh, I, I got a lot of friends and family that help me out and hold a camera and when, you know, when we need them. And so we just try to try to do the sport justice, try to make sure, you know, we can get the, get it out to the masses. And I, I think the sport really deserves the attention, you know. Oh, I think it's absolutely one of the best spectator sports in off-road. Right. I mean, you're not going anywhere. 
Yeah. Everybody can watch, and, right. and it, the course doesn't disappear on you. Yeah. Um, and that's you know one of the big things with short course, right? Is like some of the best tracks in the country are the ones you can see the track. Right. And and the ones that that everyone complains about are the ones that disappear and, and no one's around to to watch. Right. So, um, it's definitely a, a spectator friendly sport. Um, there is some definite like down times in between when guys get a little rodeo on the hill and yeah. and whatnot. But speaking of rodeo, I mean you've captured some of the biggest, most amazing saves that I've ever seen on rock bouncing. Um, as well as some of the biggest wrecks <laughs> we've ever seen in rock bouncing, so um, it's pretty intense. What do you, what do you, what's your, in your mind when you're on the side of the hill and the guy's 15 feet above your head and you know full pinned? And <laughs> so most time, like you can't tell on the camera half the time, but I'm always either behind or next to a massive tree. Like if right. I can find a tree, I'm, that's what I'm gonna get. That's why I don't know what I'm gonna do out here in the dunes. But I don't have a tree to hide behind. But <laughs> I might park the razor next to me or something. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm always, I'm always, you know, I always got my exit route planned and a lot of it depends on the driver too like you know tim cameron's pretty pretty controlled you know what he's doing so like i don't really worry a lot when he starts but there's some guys out there they're just wild cards you don't know yeah. what's going to happen when they're at the bottom of the hill and, and we got some some og guys from back in the day that that you don't see as much anymore like bobby tanner there's a guy uh, called dale larson that had this checkered flag fj thing with a big block and i, I tell you it sent chills up your spine when he uh, got to the starting line and was getting ready to hit the hill because you you had no idea what he was going to do he was, <laughs> he was wreckers or checkers that was his motto and and every time you know he was he was going to send it and there's no telling where he would end up so there wasn't a, like with him starting at the bottom of the hill there wasn't a safe spot on the hill for me so right. it's just like i just getting ready to run <laughs> that's <laughs> but, when you that's when you just hope the zoom range on your camera can get, <laughs> take right. care of you just hope that you can and i, I have, i've gotten pretty good at like running away from whatever's going on and still holding the camera or you know <laughs> looking away so the eyes in the back of your head right but uh but that, i mean it's exciting you know I, i'm a drilling junkie and and you know it's it's a lot cheaper to stand on the, the hill with a camera than <laughs> to be, be in the car. buggy and in, in the, in the car, you know, tearing up parts and stuff like that. So, so uh, what do you? What's your process when? Because these guys are slinging rocks like you know a saw blade going through wood. Like how how do you keep yourself safe from those? Because I mean the tree set kind of stops the car from hitting you, right. but it doesn't stop the the raining of rock down the hill. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming you have war wounds on on your body from from various rocks and, and debris I've, I've been hit by a few rocks um probably scariest one i had uh i had one knock the mic off my camera like last weekend we were out uh filming which is just normally in front of him by the way yeah so. right like so i hold i always hold you always protect the money maker you gotta protect your face so you hold the camera in front of your face and like my mic's right here and it literally rock hit my uh mic took the mic off the camera and shot it like 50 feet back in the woods and so, I mean, most of the time it's trying, it's, it's balancing trying to get that perfect angle and then also being somewhere safe enough where I'm not going to get hit by a rock and have to go to the hospital or something. So, but I've been pretty lucky so far and, and, and haven't really had any injuries or anything, you know, from filming, but it's definitely dangerous, but. We were, uh, we were in, in Virginia, you know, last month with takeover and, and in Virginia, we do have a hill climb event that anyone can, you know, participate in. And, um, that was one of my first like bigger hills that I, I've ever covered as far as you know, on camera. Um, and so I started at the top and started working my way down the hill as guys were going up and, and, you know, at the top of the hill, things seem fine. Right. Like you get about halfway down you're like, okay, I'm starting to notice some, some rocks flying through the trees and hearing some branches snap and, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And then you get about two thirds down the hill and, and you start noticing that you're getting hit in the head and hit in the back and, uh, guys would go up and, you know, they'd hit the top of the hill and they hit that little pocket at the top that kicks them out. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, they're done. Yeah. And then two seconds later is a, is a shower of, of debris. Um, that's definitely a different world uh, when, you're, when you're trying to not only stand on your feet on a, sl a sketchy slope, but holding, you know, multiple thousands of dollars in your hands of equipment and then realizing that you have to protect your noggin, too, because right. <laughs> there's stuff coming at you. Yeah. That's like, if it was easy, like, we would just carry a riot shield and just, like, cut a hole for the lens. But <laughs> that's that's I mean, not a bad idea. <laughs> I just can't. I can't haul that much stuff around. And it, it's funny. Every once in a while, we'll have, like, TV show crews or something come out and want to want to film the sport. And uh, they'll come out there with those huge cameras. And we'll have, like, the rig where they wear a backpack. that has got a breeze that and comes and over and everything. And I'm just like, if something happens, like, how are you going to run? Right. You know, like you can't run with all that. So I'm just sitting <laughs> up there with my little camera, you know, ready to run. Yeah, no, that's it's definitely a, a skill that people don't think about being on the side of the hill like that. Now, some of the other people that are on the side of the hill are like safety crew and, and some of the guys that assist. Um, you know, is that I know in, in rock bouncing, um, there's a lot of effort making the car safe. 
um, you know, what kind of efforts are there, are there on the hill during an event to make sure that those guys are, are taken care of when they crash and roll and, and do all that? Right, yeah, usually they do a good job of having recovery crew and, and guys with fire extinguishers and stuff like that. We had a, a pretty pretty big fire um, earlier this year that uh, definitely made everybody take note and, uh, and, and step up their safety and everything. So, But, I mean, with anything, and I've done a little bit of racing myself too with these guys and, and – it makes you feel better and it makes you push yourself harder knowing that those guys are there, you know, ready to take care of you, roll you back over, put a fire out, you know, right. when you're racing. Cause you know, you don't have that when you're trail riding, but <laughs> that's for and sure. that's, that's the good thing about racing is it'll push you. I've hit stuff trail ride or hit stuff racing that I would never do trail riding. So that's, you know, one of the fun things about racing is they push you outside your comfort zone, push you past your limits. So the, uh, the, the race series is a uh, race series. Is that plural? Certain series is, <laughs> Sure, we'll go with it. Um, you know, what kind of time of year are they operating? Is it kind of just a year-round thing, or do they do like ice and snow events? Like, uh, we don't really do a lot of ice and snow events. We they usually start in like March. We'll get back from King of the Hammers, have a little bit of a break, and then we'll have a race, and then it really goes until you know end of October usually. And then we'll have a little winter break, and sometimes in the middle of summer when it's super hot, they'll, they'll have a little bit of a break window in there too. So uh, something that I've noticed is uh, we're starting to see in like UTV sport. Uh, a lot of younger crowd of racers being brought up in the in the sport and in the industry. It's getting mature enough now that we're starting to get the next generation. We can we can actually say we have a next generation coming up in the sport, right? Right. And I notice now, like you have cash on on a balancer now, and and some other kids, younger. I want I don't want to say kids, but younger people uh, in the sport. Is is that becoming more popular? With is it just the kids of the parents that we're doing it, or is it becoming more popular? Uh, I think it's com- it's a little bit of both, you know. Uh, of course, they, they want to make it a, a full family deal. You know, if you can bring your whole family out and you know your kids can race with you, I think that's that's always a good thing. But you know, we got kids like Cash, and I mean, I raced against Cash when he was ten, eleven years old, and still beating everybody in the field. I mean, you got <laughs> you got no fear and, and you know unlimited race budget, and they just I mean that kid can drive. You know, we uh, ended up buying one of Tim Cameron's old bouncers, and then they brought it to us, and we got the seat fitted and and, and did some modifications and stuff to him so he could. So he could and he was at it. cameras this year too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And uh, he does does really well in that big buggy. And I mean, it's got big blocks, probably 800, 900 horsepower. And kids 12 years old, <laughs> I think. I mean, it's just it's just we got to get him and uh, Ruslan together and yeah. have them go have some fun. That'd be pretty awesome. Um, well, you know, we're we're at takeover uh, this week. We uh, are looking forward to an exciting next few days and and all that. You're gonna come out and check out Huck Fest and Willie Fest and all oh, that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I, I definitely, uh, it's been a while since I've gotten any kind of, uh, you know, footage or anything from the Dune. So I'm ready to, to see what's going on, especially with the, the drag race and stuff. I think it's going to be pretty neat. And the unlimited class and the pro class, I think yep. are going to be pretty entertaining. I don't know what unlimited class is. I'm sure yeah. the side by side blog guys are probably bringing all their crazy cars out. Yeah. That ought so to be fun to see. The, uh, the, ra- the drag racing happens all three days. We have our sport class, which is our, our stock class uh, on Thursday. We have uh, the pro class, which is all your bolt on power accessory type deals um anything besides tearing apart the motor right and and doing that and then we have our unlimited on saturday which is run what you brung as long as it looks like a utv and has you know some sort of recognize recognizable plastics or something on it um and so yeah we'll probably end up seeing like the blogs to jay-z and 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 all that stuff out there and i know um superior motorsports they brought their uh, x3 build and and a few other guys are here with cars and i know there's a lot of racers online been talking about coming up here and racing this week this week so uh we'll see who shows up and who throws down and and what happens and uh it'll be a good time for sure um so uh bust and knuckle films you know where can we find the content you create where can we find the website the merch that you're selling here at the event and 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 online and then you know where can we see you at the next events that you're going to cool yeah uh knucklegear.com that's our full uh apparel website um and of course on youtube bust knuckle video bust knuckle films on every other platform and we're on everything tiktok instagram you know you name it snapchat we're on all of it Did you hear that ian he's on tiktok yeah. Just <laughs> yeah. you gotta be everywhere man you never know where somebody's gonna find you and, and find your youtube channel so yep. that's that's part of you know and congratulations i mean you're at about three quarters of the way to a million followers on uh, youtube that's a pretty big achievement so congrats i mean i think i followed you back when you were still at 100 somewhere <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So it's it's been a crazy ride seeing you grow and and obviously you know with this kind of a sport everybody's always intrigued no matter where you're from right. crazy power crazy tires crazy wrecks 
all that kind of stuff. We're working towards a million. We'll get there eventually. <laughs> we'll have to throw a party out on the hill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so check them out. You can check out the podcast on Google, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, iHeartRadio, all those different places, as well as YouTube. So uh, we'll throw some content up from our discussion of, of examples of what uh, he's been up to. And uh, until the next time, guys, we look forward to seeing you here back on the podcast. Peace.